Okay, I'm going to say something that might kind of get me in trouble here for a minute. I have known a lot of people that have used nicotine in one way or another. And one of the things that personally I've kind of noticed is that a lot of times they're very thin. Now, I don't want to jump to conclusions because correlation does not equal causation. I've also known quite a few obese smokers and whatnot but it encouraged me to look into this a little bit because there's interesting literature suggesting that nicotine could be beneficial when it comes down to fat loss. Now, full disclaimer, this is ex extremely important. Smoking and nicotine are not necessarily the same, okay? A cigarette has a lot of things that are in it a lot of chemicals, a lot of ingredients, if you want to call them that. Nicotine, we're talking about straight nicotine. Okay, nicotine binds to a nicotonic acetylcholine receptor in the brain and throughout the body. And it's a pretty like normal thing. We have a receptor for that nicotine specifically. Smoking, not good, definitely not good. So I'm not condoning that. Anyway, let's take a look at this literature because it's quite interesting. Now, after today's video, I popped a link down below for a sauna blanket. This is super cool, really, really cool. That's also a 15% off discount link for a sauna blanket, but Bond Charge created this blanket that's an infrared sauna. So it's portable or you can roll it up and store it. You don't need to have a big barrel sauna in your yard or whatever. Heats up super quick, up to 176 degrees. I use it for warming up on days when I feel like my joints aren't ready to work out. Like I hop in there for 10 minutes and I feel alive. Infrared is really interesting because it kind of heats you from the inside out. So you're getting this cellular effect much quicker than you are with a dry heat sauna. Now, I prefer a dry sauna when it comes down to the heat shock protein effect. Don't get me wrong, like I prefer a dry sauna. I like the high heat, but the cool thing about the infrared saunas in this blanket fashion is it's highly portable. So I use both. I bring the roll up sauna with me, this you know sort of blanket version. Anywhere that I can travel with a car, I'll bring it because it's too big to travel with on a plane, but I'll definitely put it in the car if I'm on a road trip or something. Anyhow, that link is down below in the top line of the description highly, highly worth it. You know the benefits of saunas. I'm gonna first start with a fascinating study that was published in the journal Life Sciences. Okay, now, again, disclaimer, rodent model stuff, not a lot of human literature here, but this explains some things that are kind of interesting. Okay, they gave subjects, in this case rodents, six milligrams of nicotine per kilogram of body weight compared to control. Then they gave another group 12 milligrams of nicotine per kilogram of body weight, also compared to control, okay? And they measured them over a period of time, and these were overweight rats. And what they found is that the rats that had the nicotine at either six or 12 had similar amounts of weight loss, okay? They had reductions in fat mass, they had reductions in body fat percentage, and preserving lean mass, but they also had a 22% drop in plasma insulin. What was most interesting about this, although there was a somewhat incremental factor that came into play, like better effect with more, it wasn't that much better. The lower dose nicotine had almost a similar effect as the higher dose nicotine. We don't really know from this paper what's going on, okay? We do know that there could be mitochondrial effects. We do know that nicotine does influence the mitochondria, which I'll talk about in a, little bit, in a little bit. But we also know that nicotine can influence the brain and regulate appetite. So what we don't know from this study is if the rodents were eating less or not. So with that, we turn to another paper. Now, personally, I can tell you the small handful of times that I have used a nicotine pouch, I have noticed my appetite is like nil. So I'm guessing there's something there. And knowing that we have these nicotonic acetylcholine receptors heavily, heavily concentrated in our brain, which is why we get perked up from it and we get this effect, it would make sense, right? So let's look at this other paper. This was published in the journal Endocrinology, okay? And it put mice in a caloric surplus, a uh, high fat diet to really just be sort of an unhealthy way of gaining weight, 45% of their calories from fat. So just unhealthy, just rat chow plus a lot of fat versus a 10% calories from fat. Okay, so they basically wanted to get them overweight and unhealthy. Okay, they did this for eight weeks and then the sixth week in, they added nicotine in. 
What is extremely interesting is after they added the nicotine in, the weight gain stopped. In fact, it even reversed in the nicotine group. Okay. They also saw reductions in fat mass, reductions in body fat percentage, and maintenance of lean body mass, not to mention significant reduction in food intake. Okay, so above all else, if you're halting weight gain and possibly reversing it, the food intake probably is the biggest thing. The interesting thing about mice, about rats, rodents in general, and humans are probably this way too, but when you put them in this chamber and you just let them eat ad libitum, they're gonna really listen to their body, right? Like humans, we have so many external cues and influences, like it's hard to get us to really like listen to the cues of when to stop eating. Mice, they'll stop eating when it's time to stop eating, but they'll also just continue to eat if given the opportunity. They selectively were just like, nah, okay, we're done eating. But let's understand the mechanisms here, like what's potentially happening. Well, what they noticed in this study is that two things, well, three really. Fatty acid synthase was reduced. Fatty acid synthase synthesizes fatty acids, right? So you take, basically allows you to store fat, particularly in the visceral fat, fatty liver sort of thing. Okay, that could be one thing. We see this in some other compounds that aren't nicotine, and although it's important, like even allulose, for example, allulose is the sweetener, right, that we see in the low carb space. This has an effect at reducing fatty acid synthase. And that does seem to play an impact, but it will play a role, but it's not that, that much. So I, I have a hard time believing that the fatty acid synthase is the main reason nicotine is having this effect. What is interesting, however, is the decrease in AMPK hypothalamically, if that's a word, and the increase in AMPK phosphorylation in the body. What does that mean? If you were to eat at maintenance level and then suddenly reduce your calories, AMPK would increase, right? It's like a marker of a deficit. It is a switch that flips in your body to tell your body it's time to start using stored fuels. So when AMPK is activated, it's a clear sign that your body is not only in a deficit, but really like starting to upregulate systems and processes that are associated with using onboard fuel. So the fact that AMPK increased in the body, yes, that's a good thing. And the decrease in the brain is usually indicative of basically the brain not thinking it's hungry. So when you have like a decrease AMPK in the hypothalamic area, that means brain doesn't think you're hungry, but body kind of does. So it's like this mismatch that's pretty cool. So that could mean that you don't have a desire to eat as much, even though your body's kind of telling you to eat. Now, I go back to this whole thing, like a lot of times people take a nicotine pouch or unfortunately even smoke when they're hungry. And they find that if they're trying to quit smoking, their appetite goes up, right, and they gain weight. So I'm not saying everyone should go out and smoke. Smoking is not good. Don't smoke, please don't, okay. But nicotine has promise, at least in the rodent model research. And if you look at the longevity science, most researchers are bullish on nicotine it's just not the same as smoking. So I hope that you can compartmentalize those two and kind of look at them selectively. Now, here's the thing. I don't use nicotine. So I'm not telling you to do it because I do it. I'm not doing that at all. Personally, I don't feel too great when I use it. I'd love to hear your experience in the comments as well because I wanna do more content on this and I wanna understand how people feel when they use like those Zen pouches. I get kind of anxious. I actually feel kind of sick to my stomach, but I also know a lot of people that really use them and really love them. So this is a little bit of how it works and how it could be beneficial. Now, from a mitochondrial standpoint, let's touch on this real quick. It increases the ability for your mitochondria to go from zero to 100 better. It changes sort of its ability for your mitochondria to idle at a lower speed. So this could be really good for metabolic health not just obesity. This is called the respiratory control ratio. So it's basically the ability for your mitochondria to require less at a lower intensity, less demand, but then also have the ability to like crank it up to 12 when it needs to. So <laughs> those dots haven't been connected because that's much more looking at like a metabolic health insulin sort of piece, whereas the obesity piece is looking more directly at obesity mechanisms. But I think that those two can interplay and I would love to see research there. As always, keep it locked to here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.